Nebuchadnezzar was a giant, a giant of great metal. Yet it is the stone that causes the collapse, the rock that outlives flesh, the brick that withstands the heat. When the enemy throws you into the flames, know that your foundation is solid. No fire is fierce enough to consume you, and death cannot hold you. When Nebuchadnezzar gazed into the flames, he saw the rock, the cornerstone of the earth, the foundation of faith, the savior of the soul. What he saw was Jesus Christ. In this video, I am to discuss King Nebuchadnezzar with the goal to entice people to read the works within the Bible so that they may follow more closely the Word of God. If you enjoyed the contents of this video, please remember to like, and if you would want to see more, subscribe. King Nebuchadnezzar, also known as Nebuchadnezzar II, is a prominent figure in ancient history. He ruled Babylonia from 605 to 562 BC and is considered one of the most influential and long-reigning kings of the Neo-Babylonian era. Born in Babylon as the son of Nabopolassar, the founder of the Chaldean dynasty, Nebuchadnezzar continued his father's legacy by succeeding him on the throne. His own son, Evil Merodach, would later follow in his footsteps. Nebuchadnezzar is most famously remembered for his role in the destruction of Jerusalem in 526 BC, which resulted in the captivity of many Hebrews in Babylon. He returned to besiege Jerusalem again in 586 BC, as documented in the book of Jeremiah. This campaign led to the capture of the city, the devastation of Solomon's temple, and the deportation of Hebrews into captivity. The story of King Nebuchadnezzar comes to life in historical accounts found in the books of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Jeremiah and Daniel. Within the book of Daniel, we learn that individuals with exceptional talents were selected and deported to serve the king of Babylon. Among them were young Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, who later became known as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. The book of Daniel is a distinctive work within the Old Testament featuring a blend of historical narratives and a significant transition to prophetic visions. Throughout both the historical and prophetic segments, Daniel skillfully argues for the absolute sovereignty of God, asserting his control over numerous self-absorbed foreign powers. This recurring theme of divine sovereignty is evident in various instances, including Daniel's miraculous deliverance from the lion's den, the rescue of his friends from a fiery furnace, and the future promise of the Ancient of Days coming to rescue his people from the clutches of evil forces. Daniel's bold and unwavering faith in the Lord is evident in the first chapter of his book. He refused to consume the meat and wine provided by the king because he did not wish to defile himself with their food and the pagan procedures used in its production. The Lord ensured that the appointed overseers of Daniel and his friends viewed them favorably and thus their request was granted. Instead of the king's provisions, Daniel and his friends were allowed to eat pulse, which is defined as a mixture of wheat, barley, flour, beans, lentils, and parched corn, along with water to drink for a period of 10 days. If, after this time, they appeared to be in worse condition than those who had eaten the king's food, they could be appropriately punished for their defiance. However, to the surprise of their overseers, Daniel and his companions displayed superior health, physical condition, and overall appearance. Due to this demonstration of dedication to the Lord, God bestowed upon these young men knowledge, wisdom, and the ability to understand various forms of visions and dreams, whether they were their own or someone else's. And thus, we arrive at chapter 2, the first of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Quote, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, and the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, 
and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if ye show the dream, and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts, and rewards, and great honour. Therefore show me the dream, and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me, till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king, and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler, that asked such things at any magician, or astrologer, or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. The king, furious at this response, then commands that all the wise men in Babylon be destroyed. With a decree sent out, it quickly reached Daniel and his companions, and they responded with a question regarding the haste of the command. The captain of Nebuchadnezzar's forces then informed Daniel, and Daniel requested the king's presence. The request was granted, and Daniel told the king that he could interpret the dream, but he needed some time. That night the Lord reveals the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, to which Daniel responds, saying, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Chapter 2 continues to read, The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream, and the visions of thy head upon thy bed, are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter, and he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. The head of the idol described, made of gold, symbolizes King Nebuchadnezzar. However, after the era of gold, there will come a time of brass, representing an inferior empire that will overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. This kingdom, while less powerful, will rule over the earth, symbolizing the Persian Empire. Subsequent parts of this idol can be attributed to the Greco-Macedonian Empire, which overthrew the Persian Empire, and lastly, the Roman Empire, characterized by its strong rule. But as it absorbed external entities, the Roman Empire became unstable, resembling a mixture of iron and clay. In this weakened state, a permanent kingdom would be established, symbolizing the Kingdom of Christ.
chapter 2 continues to read, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odours unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In chapter 2, we encounter a visually described idol with components symbolizing the distant future. Then, in chapter 3, we learn how Nebuchadnezzar completed the construction of a physical idol. Its components are made of pure gold, but what foreshadows the future is the description of its dimensions. Chapter 3 reads, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. To help illustrate the significance of the statue's construction, I will reference groundbreaking discoveries from a channel called Truth in Christ, specifically their video titled Jaw-Dropping 666 Discovery Utterly Proves the King James Bible is God's Preserved Word. In the video, Truth in Christ highlights the importance of the number 666 and demonstrates how it is connected to figures in the Bible. They also emphasize the deliberate use of the words 600, 3 score, 60, and 6, which serve specific purposes achievable only through the divine work of the Lord God. The first noteworthy observation for the purpose of this video is that the height of Nebuchadnezzar's statue corresponds to the number of times Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned in the Bible. Second, this described idol and its worship foreshadow the beast system mentioned in the Book of Revelation. Third, Nebuchadnezzar's idol, built in Babylon, aligns with the image of the beast, which is associated with the concept of mystery Babylon described in the Book of Revelation. However, to properly convey the importance, I think it best to hear from truth in Christ himself. Now, look at the parallel here between the image of Nebuchadnezzar and the image of the beast. If you're not familiar with the Bible, the image of the beast, which is going to become alive, could be artificial intelligence, could be a clone of him himself. Like the technology has come this far where it's just you don't know. But basically what we have here in Daniel is paralleling what happens in Revelation. In Daniel it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three square cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. And he sets it up in Babylon, by the way, in, in Revelation, we're dealing with mystery Babylon. Now in Revelation 13, 14, it says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. So he commands them to make an image to the beast. And Nebuchadnezzar makes an image of gold. Now, look how it parallels. It says, Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. And over here it says, And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. So, chat, uh, so Revelation 13.7 is talking about the first beast and his power. And then Revelation 13, 12 is talking about the second beast, and he re he's receiving all the power of the first beast. He's receiving the power of all kindred, songs, and nations. And 
He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth, and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Okay. That at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. So you're saying, well, this one is saying to worship the beast, and this one is saying to worship the image. Well, yeah, but look. It says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Continuing from where truth in Christ left off, in response to the construction of the statue and the subsequent command to worship it, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to this new idol and system. Their defiance was promptly reported to the king. Quote, then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. In his further enraged state, the king proceeds to fulfill his promise and orders that the furnace should be heated seven times hotter than usual. For those familiar with the word of God, you may recognize the frequent use of the number seven. Its mention here signifies to me the first sign of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's safety amid their death sentence. The three men are bound, still wearing their attire, a detail included to emphasize their security in the flames as all their described clothing is flammable and would typically, under ordinary circumstances, burn. The king's men then carry the three bound men. However, as they approach the fire, the king's men are killed. Once again, this is a sign of the three men's impending miraculous safety, as the fire within that furnace is no ordinary fire. It is the presence of the Lord and his righteous spirit. Continuing to read chapter 3, it goes on to say, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counsellors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. As correctly stated by Nebuchadnezzar, the fourth man in the fire is the Son of God. He is the image of God Nebuchadnezzar became aware of through his dreams and their interpretation by Daniel. The reason I mention these facts is that in modern translations, this verse, among many others, is where the modern versions of the Bible remove Christ, the Son of God, from his own word. Instead, they opt for plurals over singular terms, and this distinction becomes apparent when you are not reading from the true word of the Lord, the King James Bible. I mention this to encourage you to stop reading from the corrupted modern versions of the Bible. To illustrate this distortion of God's word, I once again refer to the video titled, Jaw-Dropping 666 Discovery Utterly Proves the King James Bible is God's Preserved Word. I'm going to show you how modern translations, you have probably been taught that they are just easier to read versions than the King James. 
you have been taught that the V's and the vowels of the King James are, it makes it really hard to read that Elizabethan English. And for that reason, you need to get a modern version so you can understand the Bible. When I was reading for five years, the NIV and the ESV, and that's why I have grace towards other people who read these versions, because I was reading from these versions for five years. I had no idea there was differences in the Bible translations. I was clueless. I was ignorant. So I hope that this reaches somebody that is also in that place where they are, they're trying to find the truth. They're trying to seek out what, what is truly of God and what truly isn't. So the problem with modern translations is not just the deleted verses. The problem is the text is changed virtually everywhere and you have no idea where. Because if you, the way to keep track of it is to go through every single verse of a King James and go through every single verse of a modern Bible and keep track of all the little changes that are made. And it's, there's every single chapter. And they're filled, they're all over the place. And it's not just little things. They're big things. They're big deals. So just a brief sample size, and this isn't even covering everything, not even close. These are just examples where Jesus is condemned to death. Where Jesus Christ is kicked out of his own book. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ is kicked out of his own book. Do you really think God has anything to do with a Bible that kicks out Jesus Christ from his own book? Let's go through it. New King James, ESV, NIV, and NASB. Now I'm going to um, make a note now that the ESV, NIV, NASB are going to be very similar to basically any other modern translation, like the NLT or the CSB or uh, what have you. They're all going to be very similar because those are the ones that will pull from the text that comes from here. Okay, so... The, the modern translations besides the New King James. Now, the New King James does take from it a little bit as well. And the New King James is corrupt. There is no question about it that it is corrupt. And I'll show you here just Jesus Christ being kicked out of it. Um, but it is a separate animal than the other ones. The other ones are a hundred times more corrupt. Okay, so the New King James says Genesis 22, 17. Now, this is in the Old Testament. And this is talking about Jesus Christ. And how do we know that? Galatians 3.16. Let's read Galatians 3.16 first. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now, an easy way to know that these, the thous, and the thys of the King James Bible and why they are there is actually very important. Thy means singular, one. Thee, thy, thou, if it's a T word, it's talking to one person or about one person. If it's a ye or a you or a your or yours, a Y word, it's talking to more than one person, two, three, or more people. That's a very important distinction in some passages. Very important. Because you know if it's talking directly to one person only, or if it's talking to a group of people. That is incredibly important information in some verses of the Bible. Now this one, the importance is not just the thy, but it's the importance is the seed. It's not seeds as of many. It's seed, singular. Now look at what it says in the King James. That in blessing I will bless thee. And what does it say the seed is? Thy seed which is Christ. Thy seed is Christ. So the seed is Christ. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Because thy seed is Christ. He's going to, Christ is going to possess the gate of his enemies. New King James. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants. Notice the difference. Notice what's on the end. It says, your descendants with an S. 
Do you see the problem with that in Galatians 3.16? He saith not, and to seeds as of many. But here it says, I will multiply your descendants. That's many. As the stars of heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Jesus Christ has been kicked out of this verse, has been condemned to death in this verse in the New King James Bible. Now let's keep going. John 8, 35. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever in the King James. Now notice how son is capitalized, and it says the son. That's talking about Jesus Christ. New King James. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. The Son, capitalized S, a son. Now, it's an allegory or a story that alludes to Jesus Christ. However, in the King James, this is Jesus Christ talking about himself directly, not indirectly. He's talking about himself directly abiding forever. Pointing to his deity. Now, over here, we don't have that. So, there's an issue. Jesus Christ getting kicked out of his book. Now, what's interesting with this one, which is very interesting, actually, especially for people who think original only, which we've already reproved with the Bible itself, you don't have a distinction between uppercase and lowercase in Greek. So this verse in Greek, you could never know if that's directly talking about the Son, Jesus Christ, or if that's talking about a Son. You have no idea in Greek but you do in English. You do in God's book, in his finished word. He has revealed it and made it clear who he's talking about. He's talking about his son, Jesus Christ. He's talking about himself. The ESV. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus Christ was not killed for himself, crucified for himself but he sacrificed himself for the world, for the sins of the world. Daniel 9.26 in the ESV says, And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Jesus Christ has been taken out of this verse because that's not even capitalized. And that's not a sacrifice either. That's just dying. He's condemned to death. In this verse. Matthew 18 11 is not found in the ESV. Jesus Christ is kicked out for the Son of Man has come, is come to save that which was lost. Luke 9 56 same thing for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save them and they went to another village. Look who's missing in the ESV. Do you think it's okay that Jesus Christ is kicked out of his book? Do you think it's okay with God that his son is being kicked out of his own word? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. On me is deleted. Jesus Christ is deleted. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Gone. Luke 4, 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Not here. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and of a son than an heir of God, through Christ. Through Christ. Jesus Christ is not here. He's not in this verse in the NASB. We love him because he first loved us. We love. Who do you love? Each other? One time I got a card in the mail with this verse from a modern translation implying that they love us as a family because he first loved us. But that's not what the verse is saying. We love him. The modern translations have kicked out Jesus Christ out of this verse and out of many verses in the Bible. If that's okay with you, I guarantee you it's not okay with God. After the events in the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar, along with his princes, governors, and captains 
all look upon the men who were cast into the fire and observe that not even a hair on their heads has been singed, nor does their attire smell of smoke. Nebuchadnezzar then proclaims before all, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, that every people, nation, and language, which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now we proceed to chapter 4, which contains the final of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and the subsequent actions of the king that result in his transformation into a beast. In this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar starts proclaiming the name of the Lord to his nation, suggesting that, as a result of unexplained events he has witnessed, he has turned his heart towards the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar then goes on to tell of his dream and how it made him afraid and troubled. He, as seen in previous chapters, goes on to bring forth the wise men of Babylon for the dream's interpretations. However, just as before, they cannot give him an interpretation. Daniel is brought before him, and Nebuchadnezzar says, quote, But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. While Nebuchadnezzar had been proclaiming the Lord in previous verses, he did so in a manner that suggested his ongoing attachment to his pagan beliefs. He addressed the Lord as the High God, with a capital G for emphasis. Yet, he informed Daniel that the name which he was given, Belteshazzar, was intended to honour a god, in lowercase, associated with Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar's continued use of Daniel's pagan name cements the king's ongoing attachments to his pagan beliefs. King Nebuchadnezzar goes on to tell Daniel the dream, saying, Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud, and said thus, Hew down the tree, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. The angel described in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is referred to as a watcher. This term aligns with the language used to describe the roles of angels, particularly those associated with the Biblical Flood, as detailed in the Book of Enoch. For further information on this topic, please refer to my other videos. Continuing with Chapter 4, Daniel responds to the king, saying, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream, or the interpretation thereof, trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, 
and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher, and an holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down, and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquillity. King Nebuchadnezzar, emulating the behavior of his forefathers that led to the destruction of the Tower of Babylon, where men believed themselves to be gods and sought to claim the heavens for themselves, will be brought down and removed from his position due to his iniquities. Pride had not departed from the king's heart, even after having dreams that foretold his downfall. Humility did not find a place within him. His crown had become too lofty, and so had his opinion of himself. Twelve months after receiving Daniel's interpretation, he strolled through his palace in Babylon, proclaiming, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? The response from the Lord was as follows. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Within the same hour, the described events befell Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from his kingdom into the wilderness. There he ate grass, sustained by the dew of heaven, with his hair grown like eagle feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. After seven years of humility, crawling on all fours, Nebuchadnezzar worshipped the Lord completely. In that moment, he cast off his beliefs in his pagan gods, just as a beast sheds its fur. Quote, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honoured him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honour and brightness returned unto me, and my counsellors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. In conclusion, King Nebuchadnezzar was like a bronze bull, an iron fist, a golden god. Yet he bore a mark, a mark that transformed him into a beast, a mark that foretells future events. As we delve into the past, we catch glimpses of the future. When facing adversity, when thrown into the furnace in the heat, we hear his voice. In the fire, we see his visage, and in the flames, we feel his presence. The enemy may see death, but death cannot conquer life. Death cannot defeat. Jesus Christ. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, the aim is to get you interested in the works of the Bible. If your interest has been piqued, then please read the original text yourself. 
If you have additional commentary on Nebuchadnezzar and the events discussed within this video, then please leave a comment, I look forward to reading them. Additionally, if you have a different topic that you would like to see me tackle, then again, please leave a comment. If you wish to support the work I do here on this channel, please see my Patreon. You will be given exclusive access to additional content. On that note, thank you to my patrons and channel members. I am blessed to have your support. If you enjoyed, please remember to like and subscribe as it helps the channel immensely. God bless and goodbye.